Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, welcome and good evening to all. Uh, before to start, I want to share something about BASE. Bengali Academia for Social Empowerment, BASE, is a developmental organization registered as a trust by a collective of academicians, scholars, professionals, and other like-minded people working for underprivileged section of the society and their social development. In current socio-political scenarios and backwardness of certain sections, we think that there is a tangible need to organize intellectually. This is an effort to reach out as many as we can in various ways and platforms. Primarily, we are building a network to replace a relate of related people in higher education, which is helpful in different ways, especially for information and resource sharing. This creates a better linkage among concerned people of various institutions across Bengal, India, and abroad. In this, in this pandemic time, BASE has done tremendous relief work and started more than 25, 25 community kitchens and done massive relief work in Amphan affected areas. With this related work, BASE has, BASE has been conducting online lectures since last two months. And today's lecture is lecture number 37. And today's topic is Maulana Vashani, Red Maulana, and subaltern Muslims of South Asia. And today, our esteemed speaker is Dr. Laili Huddin. So I would request uh, Sheikh Abdul Matin, Assistant Professor in the Department of International Relations, Jadapur University, uh, to welcome uh, today's uh, speaker as well as today's chair. So, Sir Matin, okay. over to you. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. Uh, this is indeed a privilege to introduce uh, a speaker as well as chair of today's lecture. And as you all know, what Mr. Hassan just said about base, base is doing intellectually, you know, very brilliant things. I mean, like a lot of things apart from uh, doing sort of direct social interventions of in terms of providing relief the, uh, for the um, armed fund victims or the relief for the poor kids. Apart from that, they are doing sort of uh, intellectually very sound stuff, you know, uh, in terms of uh, organizing conferences, uh, regular talks, uh, and also, you know, uh, building up uh, an academic, strong academic fraternity who really interested in interrogating many questions, the questions of uh, discrimination, the questions of social exclusions, questions of intellectual history, gender, caste, race, and many other things. Uh, with this part of our base lecture series today, uh, as Hassan mentioned, as an important uh, talk on Maulana Bhasani. And just to, I mean, like it is reserved for the speakers and the chair, but just to say a few words, uh, uh, Maulana Bhasani has been one of the intellectually, one of the important popular figure of modern South Asia and which is mostly undermined in the academia, both in, uh, both, both in India as well as in, in the European world. Uh, uh, and we really need to intellectually engage uh, both in terms of, of his politics, of also of, of his sort of a repository of intellectual resources. Recently, I was in Santos, uh, his uh, place in Bangladesh. So I met many people along with Somitra Dosidar, and uh, it's absolutely uh, fascinating to see the kind of institutions, the kind of you know people's network he have built over the years in in in, in the in the history of uh, modern South Asia. Uh, with these words, like it's very privileged to introduce uh, Dr. Laili Huddin. Uh, she is presently currently Labour Home Early Career Fellow at King's College London. Uh, well, uh, Laili really doesn't also need introductions among the academy in the South Asian circle. Uh, he's basically uh, training in his, as a historian, uh, history of modern South Asia, and currently working on a very fascinating book project, uh, making and unmaking of Pakistan and Bangladesh. Uh, he has earned his degrees from all the prestigious universities of the world, like LSE, Harvard, Oxford, and University of London, what not. I mean, uh, and uh, uh, his super, her supervisor, 
professor francis robinson and she worked with uh, him and sort of uh, his thesis her thesis title is in the land of eternal eid maulana bhasani and the political mobilizations of peasants and lower ca- class urban workers in east pakistan uh, yes she has presented uh, you know multiple research papers all across uh, universities around the world in uh, university of toronto oxford cambridge columbia philadelphia uc berkeley new york university bracket dhaka lums university of nottingham texas gottingen where we met uh, i mean like list is on and on uh, uh, but i'm really i am like very lucky to uh, read her recent publications on modern indian studies journal and modern indian studies on on enemies agent at work uh you uh, know that the micro history of adam ji and cornofuli rights in east pakistan and and this is really she is really uh, done a great contributions to the uh, you know uh, especially in the field of uh, violence uh, and in in the hist south east in history intellectual history uh right now uh, uh, she has engaged with uh, another important project at kings uh, which is a uh, sort of mostly the red islam and most mostly thrusting on islamic socialism uh, with this few words uh, i highly will welcome you on our web uh, seminar based talk and uh, now i would like to read out our uh, fascinating equally fascinating chair today's chair dr mosharraf hosen khan we affectionately call mosharraf da uh, <laughs> mosharraf da is alumni from our university of hyderabad he has done his masters from there and then later did phd from new york university and just let me tell you university of hyderabad has been an important place for all young researchers who thinks bit differently uh, mm-hmm. uh, and see dr khan is presently assistant professor at jindal global law school uh, and uh, i mean like he is also the founder editor of cafe dissensus as very you know uh, one of the i would say very important uh, web journal mag- magazine which gives a lot of space to the young upcoming uh, you know scholars uh, across the world especially on, from south asia uh dr musra hussain khan along with dr murshid alam they are editing a fascinating project uh book project called mapping muslims lives in west bengal uh, this is will be one of the important uh, contributions in the liter- bengali muslim literature after rafiuddin ahmed i mean uh, so we are very much hopeful with that book project uh, al musraf da uh, uh, like also uh, presented i like his, uh, his uh, you know academic presence all across the world including harvard princeton new york university his own <laughs> university where he did his phd no, 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 presidency no, no, gaji nazrul islam university uh, mm-hmm. musraf da we are very much thankful for you know uh, to agree to chair this today's talk with these few words and uh, apart from us we have very fascinating intellectual audience also in our discussions so we are uh, hopeful that uh, you know we will able to contribute something in the discourse with these few words this is over to dr musaramda okay uh, thank you very much uh, motin i want to call you by your formal you know dr motin or professor motin i just call you motin So thank you very much for this introduction. I don't think I deserve all of that you said, but it's okay. It's not about me. I'm really privileged to be chairing this session with uh, Dr. Laila Udin, who is very well known and whose research I came across her uh, research project way back when Amitabh Ghosh shared uh, on his blog about his meeting with uh, Professor Udin in British Library in London, and then. He wrote a blog piece on that, and that's the first time, honestly speaking, I came to know that there is someone who is working on Maulana Basani. Uh, and I've been following uh, Dr. Udin's work on and off, of course, and it's fascinating what, where she is going with her work at the moment. Uh, also, I should say that I encountered Maulana Basani when I was writing a chapter. One of my chapters in my dissertation was on Bangladesh fiction from Bangladesh. You know, Anglophone as well as Bengali uh, novels uh, on 1971, because one of the chapters I wrote in my thesis was on 1971, and that's exactly when I encountered the figure of Maulana Basani for the first time. And I remember reading, you know, working and writing on this novel, Chile uh, Gota Shepai by Akhtar Zaman Elias, uh, the soldier in the attic. I mean, in translation, which is being translated at the moment, by the way. 
So uh, very interestingly, I mean, when I saw the title of today's talk, the first thing that struck me that how often we sort of equate Bangladeshi liberation war or liberation war of Bangladesh with the figure of Mujibur Rahman, just one omnipotent figure. And we really neglect all these other figures who played significant, a significant part in this movement. Uh, in 1971, before 1971, and after 1971 as well. Mm. And in fact, Akhtaru Zaman Elias's novel shows, you know, there are layers, multiple layers in this. You have on the one hand, the bourgeois nationalism of uh, army league, mostly petty bourgeois class attracted to that kind of you know, nationalism. And then you have the urban underclass, there are characters like uh, Hadi Kijir, uh, you know, the, a remarkable character. In fact, I've encountered very few characters of that kind in literature. And then you have it, all these urban Marxists going to the rural areas to mobilize uh, urban, uh, sorry, the rural peasants, the pe uh, rural poor. And I remember reading in the novel that the failure of these urban Marxists who come there to mobilize and they become disillusioned at the end because they do not really have the idiom or the strategy to mobilize people from these areas, from rural areas, the peasants. And I think that's what I'm looking forward to tonight, that what was so special about this Red Maulana, Basani, mm -hmm. that he could, you know, unlike uh, the characters in uh, Akhtaru Zaman Ilyas's novel, unlike those urban Marxists, what was it in Maulana Basani that lent to a sort of, you know, a vernacular language, vernacular idiom, which, in, which could inspire that sort of devotion around him. So I, without much ado, I would, uh, now would like to invite uh, Dr. Laila Udin to deliver what promises to be a very exciting lecture. Gosh, Please. OK. Um, thank you, Musharraf. And thank you to Mateen. And thank you to the Bengali Academia for Social Empowerment for inviting me. It is a real privilege and honor. In fact, it's the first talk that I'm actually giving in the year, and I think it's particularly because it's been a difficult year for all of us, for, you know, for all the horrors that COVID has inflicted on us. There are also some silver linings in that crowd, and that's the sort of alternative venues that BASE and others are providing for subjects like Maulana Bashani to be talked about. Um, as I've said, I haven't given a talk um, in a while, so I'm a bit rusty. So I do apologize. If I'm going too fast, just put your hands up and tell me you're going too fast and I will stop. So there is another introduction to me. I should tell you that I'm also a working class academic from London who's interested in working class and rural histories as a way of thinking, as an entry point into radical thought. It's a way of understanding my life better and the work, the community that I come from. So my research and writing, which is the sort of, and, and this has been going on for the last 10 years and continues, is really on the making and unmaking of East Pakistan from the 1930s up to 1971. I look at poor peasant and lower class worker mobilization under the leadership of the enigmatic figure of Maulana Bashani, a peer, a Sufi saint, a peasant and worker leader and a politician from his days in colonial Assam to Pakistan and then to Bangladesh. So my work essentially is trying to excavate the alternative, radical and progressive political projects, imaginaries, and futures, particularly that of Islamic socialism of this period that were attempted, that attempted to think about decolonization beyond the limits of the nation state. This was a politics of liberation that continues to unsettle present day nation states and their founding narratives. So what I'm going to do today is present to you a very small section of my work, which focuses on Bashani's political politics of Islamic socialism in the 1960s. But let me kind of start off with a very basic question. Why should we be talking about Maulana Bashani? What makes him a significant subject of political history? And I wanted to start with a conversation that I was listening to a few days ago. This was a conversation between 
James Baldwin, the black American writer and intellectual and a radio broadcaster in Chicago in the 1960s. Now, James Baldwin was talking about the experience of being a black man in America, the violence, the racism and trauma and how that had left him without a sense of who he really was. To be a black man in this country, he said, is really never to be looked at. And what white people see when they look at you is not you, you are invisible. What they see when they look at you is what they have invested you with. So what, without wanting to undermine the sort of the specificity of the black American experience, that feeling of being invisible, of not being seen for who you are, but what others believe you to be also forms a fundamental part of the experience of the poor working class and marginalized communities of South Asia. Now, why do I say this? I think we can see this in the disregard and the dismissal of Maulana Bashani in scholarly and intellectual in endeavors. To date, there has been nothing written, substantial written in English, at least on a figure who is singularly important to our understanding of the politics of Northeast India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Despite the fact that his political legacy continues to endure in contemporary debates, whether it's of the, the, the NRC or of what's happening in Bangladesh, the fact that he continues to appear in the dreams of poor peasants, laborers and char dwellers in Bangladesh, Assam, and is remembered in working class diaspora circles as the Desi Malcolm X, the Desi Shay, or even the Muslim Ambedkar. Where other figures in the subcontinent, cultural, religious politics have had books, perhaps one too many written on them. Bashani has not received the same attention. Now, the reason why I think that is, is because most scholars, not all, have treated the intellectual outputs of or contributions of these leaders, say Gandhi, as both individual and universal ideas, ideas that are independent and can be abstracted from their relationship to their constituencies. The intellectual lives or contributions of the poor, marginalized and working class groups to radical progressive thought has not been taken seriously within academia unless they have been presented to us in ways that can we, we can easily understand. This is symptomatic. The reason why we've ignored these lives is because it's symptomatic of a tradition that values writing over practice, that values writing over action. So Bashani asks us to challenge this. His, his ideas cannot be separated from his subaltern constituencies, the poor peasants and the lower class, lower class workers. Bashani did not leave us with many of his writings. Um, so, yeah, Bashani did not leave us with many of his writings. His ideas and politics only come alive to us in the stories that are told of him by his constituencies or stories that talk about his relationship with them. And I think that's a deliberate act, actually, because by not writing, what Bashani forces us to do is that he makes it impossible to think about the idea of the single gifted individual that forces historical change through. What he does instead is he makes visible the intellectual production, the energy and the lives of subaltern Muslims in South Asia, something that is denied to them far often. So, when people have tried to trace the intellectual force and depth of Bashani's emancipatory politics, the scholars have looked to his time in the Deoband, in, uh, which were, um, and to the Khilafat movement, or his interactions with the urban left, the bourgeoisie, the, and it satisfied them to know that although Bashani had not read Marx, as if it were beyond him, he had been an obedient pupil of Marxist economist, Professor Akhlaq Rahman, 
or that he had been familiar with men who were seen as far more intelligent than him, and that perhaps some of their genius rubbed off on him. Others who did not see any intellectual depth simply called him charismatic. That is how he appears to us, or that is how his intellectual um, life has been presented to us. Yeah, but if we actually listen closely to the stories narrated of Bashani, the intellectual interlocutors and foundations of Bashani's politics have never been hidden. They are visibly marked on his body, his movements, and his activities. This, these stories are often mundane, ordinary, with the odd spectacular story about his living arrangements, where he lived, what he ate, how he moved around, the, and his politics. So why do people tell us stories of how he swallowed an entire Ilishmat in one go, or how he got his name from a bashan that he gave, a lecture that he gave to peasants on a chore in Assam? The answer, I think, lies in the response given to me by Kazi Fozia, a Bashani follower and a working class organizer in New York, about why she was drawn to, uh, she, she's responding to a question where I asked her, why was she drawn to Bashani's politics? And she tells me, she tells me of a statement that Bashani had said, had apparently said, Ami dur hoite, arkase hoite, komotar rajniti dekiasi. Komotar echare, amake kokono mohadristo korenai. Ami jani o chare, ami a kokono amar krishok shomir al mojdure kota polte barbona. So the translation of that is I have seen from far and close that politics of holding power. And that throne of politics has never, of power has never fascinated me. I know if I sit on that chair, I'll never be able to talk to my peasants and workers. What I'm reading from that statement is that Bashani feared intellectual decay if he sat on that throne of politics and his ideas and movements stopped reflecting the restless and that constant energy and movements of poor peasants and workers in their everyday work and struggle for dignity, justice and freedom. So yes, it is useful to know the degree of influence that Marx and other figures and Bashani's on political, Bashani's political ideas of Islamic socialism, anti-imperialism, and, and the working class as architects of future. But actually, Bashani's ideas grow out of a policy of praxis, ideas that were realized through dialogue and practice with subaltern Muslims. It is only reasonable to believe that Bashani's ideas come from those who he spent the most time with, for those for whom political struggles, the losses and the victories were real and they were necessary, and who he emulated in his clothes and his movements and his everyday politics. These were the struggling peasants of North Bengal, Assam, Sindh, Punjab and elsewhere, those who lived on the chores as well, and those who labored in the mills, factories in Bangladesh and Pakistan and India. So let me offer you a fuller introduction to Bashani here. Bashani, Maulana Bashani was born as Abdul Hamid Khan in 1885 to a rural family in colonial East Bengal and died in 1976 in Bangladesh. Bashani's political career was an extraordinarily long one, outliving most of his contemporaries, whether that's Gandhi, Jinnah, Nehru, but Jahan, Siraj Shikdar, um, Sheikh Mujib himself. His career spanned from the colonial and the post-colonial period and intersected with networks and conversations from Cuba to China. Much of Bashani's time in politics was spent upsetting various ruling regimes. He was colorfully characterized by his opponents over different periods as a demagogue, a fire eater, Hanuman, Kafir and prophet of violence. Bashani's familiarity and training in rural political conventions developed early in life. As a teenager, Bashani was a part of a Jatra Dol, a folk theater troupe enlisted for his skills in debating and ribaldry. However, before he could become a permanent member, Bashani was sent off to Madrasa by his uncle and his Islamic education 
matured in Assam, where he spent time as a murid to Pir Nasiruddin Baghdadi of the Qadri Tariqa, and then in Dioban from 1907 to 1909. Bashani spent only two years in Dioban, but his followers, this was to get uh, but his followers were to bestow him the honorific of Maulana for those two years that he spent there. Bashani's prominence as a peasant leader, politician, and Sufi leader occurred in colonial Assam. It was here that he was given the other part of his name, Bashani, for his role in settling landless Bengali Muslim migrant peasants on the chores and wastelands of Assam, and defending them against the claims they were not the son, that they were not the sons of the soil and should be affected. Bashani became the president of the Assam Provincial Muslim League and demanded Pakistan as part of a broader ethical discourse on Muslim belonging, Muslim belonging rather than Muslim separatism. After the creation of Pakistan, Bashani moved back to to East Bengal and formed one of the first opposition parties to the Muslim, to the Muslim League, the Awami League, which is in power today. That's the party that he formed first. In 1957, Bashani fell out with the Awami League and formed the National Awami Party, one of the first all Pakistan parties after the Muslim League. NAP, in short, brought together veterans and leaders of anti-colonial movements, workers of the Communist Party. The workers of the Communist Party of Pakistan had been banned by the government in 1954. So NAP is bringing those figures in and Bashani's disciples from all provinces of Pakistan on a platform of anti-imperialism and social justice. But it was in the 1960s, which is what I'm focusing on today, where Bashani created new ways of bringing the left and the Muslim question together, producing powerful alliances and imaginaries around the project of a third world Islamic socialism. Over 1968-1970, we know that protests against authoritarian regimes, war and capitalism went global. Protests in both wings of Pakistan also erupted and it eventually toppled the decade-long dictatorship of Ayub Khan. Now, the scholarly narratives of 1960... Okay, now the scholarly narratives of that period thus far have focused on the centrality of the protest of students, intellectual and artists in metropolitan cities. However, the more powerful political acts came from Bashani's mobilization of peasants and workers. The mobilization in East Pakistan began when Maulana Bashani had called for a hortal on 7th of December 1969. His decision on a hortal had come after a request that was made to him by Comrade Salim, the trade union leader of the also racial workers, to support their continuing strikes. Bashani agreed to Comrade Salim's request. And he said, if you cannot tell what people are wanting at a particular time by looking at their faces, then doing politics is futile. On that day, I saw fire in people's faces. And I knew if you called for a hortal on any other program, it would have been effective. Thus, when the uprising broke out in East Pakistan, it was not just the students whose bodies were on the front line but the also rickshaw workers, as well as other low paid workers. And that protest spread to the rural areas and in more violent and more militant ways that were imagined. Now, Bashani's politics during this period had a very defined objective, the establishment of Islamic socialism. On the 23rd to the 25th of March, 1970, Nat Bashani organized the Toba Tek Singh Conference, one of the largest, most significant gathering of peasants, workers, students, intellectual poets, artists, and left activists and workers in the history of Pakistan. Maulana Bashani informed the crowd that Islamic solution, that Islamic socialism was the solution to their economic, social, and political sufferings. 
He proposed land redistribution and nationalization of industries as key features of this project of Islamic socialism. On the basis that God was the owner of everything in the world, he demanded a popular referendum and he threatened guerrilla war if it did not happen. Bashani's calls for Islamic socialism became more insistent in the present conference is that he held in East Pakistan, in places like Santosh and Mohipur, where the processions were more visibly socialist, with atten attendees wearing red caps, scarves, badges, waving red flags, and bamboo sticks. So why was Bashani's um, Islamic socialism, or politics of Islamic socialism, so threatening to the state of Pakistan and other mainstream parties? Bashani's local politics connected to a wider dynamic and insurgent geographies, communities, ideas, and politics. It connected to an Afro-Asian socialism, af amplifying his powers. Bashani in a rally at March 19, 1969 said, our struggle is not simply to protect the interests of Pakistani peasants and workers, our struggle is for the oppressed people of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Bashani's internationalist vision was rooted in subaltern solidarities that challenged the domestic nationalist discourses of this time. He sidelines the nationalist space, and the nationalists indicating that he did not see the nationalist space as the most important or the obvious venue for revolutionary politics or imagining revolutionary futures. Now this move from local to international politics <laughs> might seem unusual in the study of Muslim politics, might, seem, might not seem unusual in the study of Muslim politics where local religious leaders have drawn upon larger effective conceptions of the Ummah, right? The, However, Bashani, what Bashani was doing was actually radically reconceptualizing the idea of the universal Muslim community. Combining leftist internationalism of the time with ideas of the Ummah, Bashani was redrawing and expanding this feeling and experience of connectedness across geographic space to forge more wider and affinities and solidarities on grounds of radical justice. So how does Bashani come to develop his ideas of Islamic socialism? Now, a lot of this is not new. This is not, this is happening over a, a long career, right? When he, and you know, some of the influence also comes from his earlier trips to Europe, Egypt, Syria, in the early to mid 1950s. And you see that in his demand for a, a non-aligned and independent foreign policy and nuclear disarmament and world peace but the trip to China to celebrate the 24th anniversary celebration had a profoundly transformative effect on him. Now, in Mao Zedong Deshe, now I think one of the slides has the, um, the sort of uh, the cover of that book. So this Mao Zedong Deshe is the only text that Bashani is known to have ever written of, you know, which has significant volume of, of his thoughts in it. So he describes this trip there as a defiant and incomparable experience, which was akin in some ways, he said, to going to Mecca itself. In the preface, he wrote, lots of my friends were hurt by my, by my travel to China. They would have even garlanded me had I not gone and had I gone to the US in this, instead. I have friends like this. I knew what they were all thinking, but still I went to China. In a conflict-ridden world, China is a huge marvel. In Asia, Africa, Latin America, they are, they are the leaders of a liberation struggle of the oppressed. I went to visit that holy space, a holy place. I did not fail in seeing it. After having experienced the rhythm of the new world, I learned to see my scattered 80 years of life in a new way. There is no shame in my mind. So what did Bashani see in China, right? What are the, what, are, what is the new world that he saw? What are the new futures that he saw? And, what I, and what you find in his book is that his encounter with Chinese communists, black militants, we have him meeting Robert Franklin William, the guy who, the, the sort of who wrote, the person who wrote, the, the black militant who wrote the founding text for the Black Panthers Party, 
is but he's also meeting Islamic socialists from Algeria, from the Indonesian Communist Party. So he has these encounters, but he's also meeting with the last emperor, Puyi, you know, the emperor who turns into a humble socialist. And then he's doing his visits to communes and factories. And what, what these encounters, observations showed to him was the possibilities of inhabiting an anti-hierarchical, anti-imperialist and radically egalitarian space, Afro-Asian socialist world, where peasants and workers, not students and intellectual, but peasants and workers are the masters of that, sort of the architects of that destiny. So Bashani ends his book on China on the same note as he starts it, as a transformed man. He had, in accordance with the sayings of the prophet, gone as far as China in his quest for knowledge. And there he had found, in his own words, the victory of the people. Now, Bashani's trips to China are in some ways like the sort of the earlier travels of Sufi saints from centuries back. You know, um, Nile Green, a scholar of Islam, writes about how Sufi peers in the early modern periods were sanctifiers of routes opened up by merchants and soldiers. In many ways, Bashani's trip is can be argued to be just that, Bashani going and helping to solidify new trade and diplomatic relations between Pakistan and China. But Bashani is doing more, right? Bashani was doing more. He was reimagining sacred socialist geographies for his subaltern Muslim constituencies, where earlier Sufi saints drew together distinct spaces on the basis of shared religious cultures, traditions, and language. Bashani was putting together atheist communist China and Mecca together in a sacred orbit on the affective and political experience of radical equality. And when I say radical equality, what, what I mean is that where the emperor was distinct, indistinguishable from the worker and vice versa. So I will now turn to Bashani's politics of Islamic socialism at home. What is he doing at home? Like where, how does he take his ideas from China to, to his sort of, uh, to his local, to, to the sort of the local space? So Bashani returns to, you know, Pakistan and it appears, what, and it appears that he sort of, um, and it's marked by what appears to be a retreat from public visibility, right? He, in 1965, he, he's no longer to be seen in Dhaka. In 1965, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the leader of the Awami League, accuses Bashani of being a collaborator to the Ayub Khan regime. But if we read a different archive, and what we see in this period is actually Bashani was stealthily organizing and mobilizing the peasantry of North Bengal as well as labor constituencies elsewhere. So Bashani does several things in this period, and I'm going to talk about two things. Right, and, and these are innovative practices that were intended to organize and mobilize his constituent groups to bring about a form of Islamic socialism, or at least prepare the way for it. So unlike the six-point program, which is put forward by the Awami League, which sought greater freedom for the Bengali populace at large, Bashani is thinking bigger. What he's doing is offering peasants and workers a model that primarily speaks to their material and spiritual emancipation. And he makes them central to its realization. It cannot be brought about without the workers and presence. So how does he do this? So he does this in two ways. And if you can just stay on this, uh, on this slide. So he does this through the introduction first, through the introduction of new relationships and linkages, brokering the most unlikely of alliances between Bashani's murids, his disciples, and the Marxist workers of Nap. And he legitimates the existence of the other and one another's world. He legitimates the existence of the Marxist and the Murid's worlds and the, and the Murid and the Marxist world. And how does he do it? He does it through changes, if not a complete innovation that is that Bashani introduces in his relationship with his Murids, particularly in the Baya, the, the Oath of Allegiance. Now, what is the Baya? Now, the buyer is uh, a sort of, you know, that has been, has been administered. It's a sort of a gatekeeping ritual of initiation. 
um, between the, the Sufi peer and his murid, his disciple. And it's usually been administered over centuries through a hand clasp or by touching the peer's unraveled turban, at which we see in the picture there. Now, once the rules have been um, set up by the, set by the Sufi master had been accepted, the disciple is formally initiated into the brotherhood and given access to the master's special knowledge of God. Now, what Bashani does is that he keeps with tradition, right? He keeps with tradition, and this is a buyer. But the, what he offers is his own distinctive brand of drawing closer to God. The buyer now is printed in a check-like format with a counterfoil of the Murid's oath alongside his signature, and it demands alongside the usual articles of belief in God, Prophet, and the spiritual lineage a belief in Islamic socialism. So the buyer states there is only one path to the freedom of all people from all forms of oppression, socialism, and I will till my last breath work to establish it. I will participate in the volunteer call of the Krishok Shamiti to eradicate the foundations of capitalism, feudalism, bribery, corruption, and all other social ills from the country. The buyer made a Marxist of the Murid and a Murid out of the Marxist. What we find with this buyer is that you find Marxist workers of Nap and Krishok Shamiti more frequently present at religious gatherings and mosques. But the Murid was to find his world equally transformed during this period, with belief in socialism now naturalized into an article of faith. The Murid's search for that deeper connection with Bashani and God was to be found in his engagement with the external world of political activism as much as the internal world of chants and meditation. Burhan Uddin, a Murid and a peasant cultivator from Tangai, in the course of performing his spiritual duties, did not only become a firm advocate of anti-imperialism, but was arrested over five times for his Krishok Shamati activity. Now, these peasants, whether recruited as Murids or by, as Marxist workers, were to find their different pledges had an equal blind, both in terms of content and form. Now, it's no coincidence that the buyer resembled the subscription form of the Krishok Shamiti. The, re the representation of the buyer in this very modern and secular form was intended to give it the same weight of authority that other paper transaction transactions had come to acquire in the life of the peasant. However, amongst the few written documents that a peasant was to accumulate in his life, the buyer stood as a reminder of what was needed for a freer and more fulfilling spiritual and material existence, drawing authority from the, both the material and spiritual registers. This was intended to be a piece. The buyer was intended to be a piece of paper that was more powerful than any other, one that promised the destruction of the hated papers of the money lender, the landlord, and the tax records. So the second intervention, so there you have the buyer. Now the second intervention that Bashani made in his um, sort of in, in in sort of in the sixties was his was his introduction of new ideas, language and vocabularies in assemblies and gatherings, which were intended to impart to the peasants and workers a sense of their own power and dynamism. Bashani introduced his constituents to their new selves over this period. They were the Sholbohara, the have-nots. Now, Sholbohara is not a new term, right? It's regularly used in the Marxist lexicon to refer to the, to the proletariat class. Bashani opened this term to incorporate wider and different histories, futures and icons, both sacred and profane. Now, again, we can see this as a reworking of who is part of the Ummah. Now, the Sharbahara for him constituted a class that was not defined by what they lacked, but rather by their ubiquitous presence, their presence across different times, geographies, and civilizations, possessing the power to change the course of history. Bashani had a public rally in Babna in 1964, 1964 clearly defined who the Sharbahara were. He said that theirs was a rich lineage from the Bani Israelis in ancient Egypt to the followers of Prophet Saleh in the land of Thamud. They were the people who had battled a class of big people who had appropriated, who had taken, stolen, 
arable land and conspired to take people's livelihood from them. But it was not just in religious times that you found the Shorba Hawa. The Shorba Hawa were to be, they were the Sicilian slaves who had revolted against the Roman Empire. The Russians, the Europeans, and the Asian, and the Asian peasants and workers of the modern age. The more immediate, immediate ancestors of the Shorbahara were those who had fought against Hindu Zamindars and Muslim Badshahs and the Wahhabi, the Farezi, the Indigo, the Nankar, the Tibaga movement. As he finished his sort of history lesson at that meeting, Bashani explained the value of their history, explained the value of it to the peasants. You are not as weak as you think you are. Actually, you're not weak at all. In the face of your united strength, any government, however powerful it is, is obliged to bow its head. Now, the easy argument for these innovations is that this was a clever mobilization tactic for bringing two very different worlds together, right? But I think what Bashani is doing is actually making very interesting and radical interventions in the world of Islam and Marxism. Now, the bureaucratization of the buyer, right, this sort of turning the, the buyer into a paper transaction appears to speak to the triumph of the print over the oral, the rational over the irrational, and to, this, and to science over the spiritual, the, over magic. But Bashani, through his charismatic authority, through his sort of position as the Sufi peer, was doing the exact opposite. He was turning the idea of paper against itself by investing it with magic. His Bashani shows that print, right, books, itself does not demystify or desacralize Islam. Bashani used this obsession with logic, science, and development to point out to what is being lost in Islam and Marxism through sort of urban intellectuals, the bourgeoisie, and students. What was being lost was the spiritual and emotional appeal of emancipation. Now, Bashani's project of Islamic socialism brought together Karachi dog workers. This is not just something that happened in East Pakistan. It brought together Karachi dock workers, brought together Punjabi peasants, North Bengal sharecroppers, industrial workers on the outskirts of Dhaka, urban intellectuals, left workers, and religious minorities in both wings. Bashani framed Islamic socialism using concepts, folk and Islamic concepts, that people could understand and connect to without it threatening their sense of moral self. On 9th of March 1969, the uprising reached its climax. Ayub Khan would write in his diary, these gangs of communists and terrorists on the prompting of Bashani are raiding police stations. They're raiding the police stations. They're sort of raiding the houses and proxies of Muslim leaders. And they're asking the chair, chairman and the members of the basic Democrats to resign. And in consequence, most of the civil officers have left their posts and so have the local rent collectors. Their records have been burned. These communists and terrorists that frightened the state so much and that compelled the dictator of Pakistan to resign were not just students, right? And the, or the middle class, but the peasants and workers as well. Now I'm gonna to turn to my conclusion. So anthropologist Stephen Fireman who works on a book on peasant intellectuals in Tanzania, wrote of the myth of the intellectually underdeveloped peasants. Now he says that the myth of the intellectually underdeveloped peasants survives because of this practical record of peasant political failure, the failure of peasants to occupy or control political power. But I, you know, I'm gonna say otherwise. I believe though that the that the myth of the intellectually underdeveloped subaltern is actually not based on their failure, but the failure of our own. And when I say our own, I mean the academics, the urban intellectuals, the sort of the, the students in excavating and recognizing the possibilities of radical thought in spaces other than our own. What I've tried to do here today is demonstrate the existence of a radical political project, a, a 
project that embraced the ideas of revolutionary solidarity. And I say revolutionary solidarity, what it's doing is that it's breaking or transgressing the boundaries of class, gender, and, and it's sort of and geographies. And so these sort of what it's embracing is, you know, this class, this project that embraced ideas of revolutionary solidarity, class struggle, and anti-imperialism. And this was a this was a project that was born out of a real connection, a practice and dialogue with subaltern Muslim constituencies. These were ideas that were at times more progressive and radical than that what we have attributed to all the people that have been written about so far in our histories. So let me return again to the question of why we should be interested in Bashani, right? Or the narrative of subaltern Muslim past. What does it offer to us? These narratives are as much about a charged present as it is about a neglected past. These narratives, the sort of this can be seen in Bangladesh states' insistence on a singular narrative for the liberation war and the criminalization of other narratives. Or it can be seen in contemporary str um, struggles around the National Register of Citizenship and the Citizenship Amendment Act. So what I want to end with is a French folklore that finds it that Fanon, France, uh, France Fanon, narrates in black skin, white masks. So it's about this French, this young French man who's returning back from the city to his rural home. He goes home and he puts on this pretense of being a stranger in his home. He doesn't recognize anything. He's unfamiliar with his surroundings. And he's unable to recognize. Um, so what he does is he notices this farming tool. And he asks his father, who's, who Fanon describes as this no-nonsense peasant. And he says, what is this tool? And what the father does is he drops the tool on the boy's feet. Fanon ends with the tale with saying, the amnesia vanishes, remarkable therapy. So Bashani is that tool, and Bashani is that reminder produced by workers and peasants of our historical amnesias, of the things that we have chosen to forget, and of the radical progressive power of subalterns and Muslims. Um, thank you. Okay, so that was a fascinating lecture, in fact. Uh, I mean, Dr. Lailuddin has covered so much ground. I'm just going to pick a few points. You know, I'm just being the chair. I have to sum up some of the points in the lecture. And I'm just going to pick a few points. First of all, I think the location of the researcher is very important, I felt, in this case. You know, I, I have often felt that the kind of research we do often comes from the location, our own location. In fact, many do not feel in, in this way, but I have always felt it. So I, when Dr. Udin said that she had taken up this project because she belongs to the working class, she identifies at least as belonging to the working class, I mean, then it's not very surprising why she would be interested in this kind of a radical alternative project. You know, the kind of project that a typical academia would not take up, as she said, because the urban academia, uh, very often trained in elite schools, may not be very comfortable with this kind of folk or rural idiom. And they may not be, they may not have any connection of any kind. So that's why I think the location is very important. I, I've always felt it. And uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Lailuddin also pointed this out. Second, I think it's also very important uh, for this kind of a project that uh, Dr. Udin is doing and what I feel, you know, the kind, the kind of shape it's taking at the moment is what could be the source of history? How is history written? You know, this is what something she was uh, pointing out. How is history written? Because we also know from our own context, you know, there are different kinds of histories that one could write. The nationalist history the Marxist history, you know, the, the history of the political elite, the kind of history we are used to reading, the kind of history we have seen often in the case of Indian partition, you know, it has always been written as the history of the elite. 
But I think this is where uh, Dr. Udin's work is so very interesting. Like, what could be the alternative sources of writing history? Could oral history, could oral, you know, sources like interviews, like she was pointing out about uh, meeting this woman in New York where who was talking about Basani. In fact, uh, so could oral sources, alternative archives be brought to bear, you know, while writing history? So that's one of the things that we should keep in mind. In fact, for figures of this kind who have not written much, I mean, in that context, she also pointed out something very interesting and which I read in some other context as well, words getting privileged over action. You know, I was reading uh, Ram Guha sometime back in one of his books, he says, in fact, he was writing about certain politicians in India uh, during the nationalist struggle, the politicians who have, who he feels are, who have left a long, you know, kind of lasting intellectual mark. And in that, he doesn't even include someone like Netaji Swachandra Bose. That's very interesting because Netaji Swachandra Bose didn't leave much writing. You know, he, he, he was a man of action. So I think when one is writing this kind of subaltern history, what could be the source, what could be the archive for that history is something that Dr. Lailuddin has wonderfully sketched out for us. Third, if Basani was actually thinking of Islamic socialism or if he was uh, Reconceptualizing the Islamic Ummah with an, you know, through this idea of Islamic socialism, where Islam and the left socialist ideas could converge to an extent. She also pointed out that it's Basani is very different because he's a man without a state. I mean, it's not the, for the first time that he's not the first one, you know, who talks about Islamic socialism. We have the case of Nasser in Egypt, right? Mm -hmm. We have the case of, in fact, you know, right after 1971, Zulfikar Bhutto in Pakistan. Mm. Yeah. Right. We have the case of even Najibuddin in Afghanistan, who was mm. ruling with the help of the Afghan, uh, uh, sorry, Russians in the uh, 80s. So we have these, you know, different projects. Of course, by that time when Russians invaded Afghanistan, by that time, Hassani was dead, of course, you know, but the influence was very much there around that time. So here is a man who became this kind of a radical figure, charismatic radical figure, without ever having a state of his own. You know, that, then what could be that source of charisma and how could one mobilize without having the benefit of ruling a state? Next. She has pointed out a couple more things. I mean, uh, uh, like his source, where did, you know, I was also wondering, uh, because I have read some of uh, Dr. Udin's writings before. <laughs> I've been following her work for a while, and I've read some of her work, and I have uh, I had in this, you know, in my mind, this very question that where did these ideas emerge from? I mean, how, his ideas of Islamic socialism, how did it exactly emerge? Was it just a trip to China? This is one question I would still like to ask. You know, these, what are the other connections uh, that we really do not get here? Like his connections to, say, Egyptian social, Islamic socialism, socialism for that matter, or around the globe, the other, you know, other, other part of the Ummah where uh, movements are happening, things are happening. Uh, was it just a, a visit to China in 1963 that changed everything for him, that inspired him to think of Islamic socialism, bringing together Islam and socialism? together, because in Bhutto's case, we know what happened, you know, in Bhutto's case, we know it's very much an influence that came from his time in America. He studied, he was in California, in Berkeley, before that, University of South California, then Berkeley. That's what, where he was inspired with, you know, some of the uh, leftist ideas. But what about Hassani? Just China, I would like you to, you know, I'd request you to elaborate a little more on this. Sure. And the last point in my summing up would be her, you know, the comments she made about Hassani's mobilization. How did Hassani exactly mobilize the poor, you know, the rural peasants, the urban underclass? Today, at this very moment, you know, for last, say, one decade or so, there's a lot of study, a lot of research on rhetoric, political rhetoric. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. very new thing that's happening in last decade or so. In fact, now people are very interested in knowing 
that what sort of language Modi exactly uses, you know, that can mobilize people. Mm -hmm. It's not just about social media. It's not just about, you know, the charisma of the politician. Mm -hmm. It's very much about language. Language is a source of mobilization. Language is a tool of mobilization. This rhetoric, uh, and Professor, uh, Dr. Lailuddin points out that he was using the language, you know, languages, words like Chorbohara. Now, we are all used to it because those who have grown up in West Bengal, you know, grown up un under the left regime, we have heard this for so long, in fact, you know, Sarbuara mm -hmm. that's how the left had branded itself. So, you know, how to bring the sacred and the profane, the kind of words that can be used, the kind of rhetoric that could be deployed to mobilize the rural population. And that's why I was saying in, in fact, at the beginning that when we read someone like Akhtaru Zaman Ilyas's novel, in that we find that's where the urban radical Marxists fail when they come to the village to mobilize mm -hmm. the rural poor because they didn't simply have the idiom. You know, they had no mm -hmm. idea how to mobilize people in the rural places. Perhaps many of us would be equally, you know, now sort of disconnected from that idiom. We right. just do not know how to speak to those people in rural areas anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, right. but Bhasani was someone who was unique in that sense that apart from the buyer that you talked about, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, he was also using a particular kind of vocabulary mm -hmm. and language, a kind of rhetoric that mm -hmm. was the mobilizing factor in his politics. So mm -hmm. I would stop here. Of course, she ended with why he is important now. So that connects to the larger question of where is the left politics at this very moment? You know, where is the politics of the dispossessed? <laughs> where is the politics of the poor? Because I have been, you know, I've been a keen follower of this and I've been recently also reading, watching a lot of interviews in which I see that some of the stalwart left, you know, intellectual thinkers have already conceded. They said there's no left now in India. Is it mm -hmm. the same case in, in Bangladesh, for that matter, in Pakistan or in other parts of the world? Is there any left? Or if there is any left, what lesson they could learn from? someone like Vasani, because our left are again, more, in most cases, very, very urban, very, mm. very, you know, sort of cosmopolitan left that we talk about, theoretically sophisticated, but without mm. much of an idea how to mobilize in the rural areas. Yeah. Exactly. So what lesson could Vasani teach us at this very moment? So I would end with this. We'll take questions. And I thank you once again for a fascinating lecture. And I'm very much looking forward to the book, to read the book once the project is complete. Nice. So thank Okay, so uh, okay, so we go to questions now. Please. So, how do we take the questions? Is there any suggestion from the organizers? Uh, Abhit is there. He will okay. uh, collect the questions. Uh, and one request, one request uh, uh, with the respect, with the permission of the chair, we have Professor Farida Latas in our yeah. in, oh. the, in the audience from NUS and in if, if sir kindly intervene and sort of an comment that would be great for us and I, sh I should say I met him long back in Hyderabad in a, at a conference and we had so great to see him again yes yes yes, yes yes where is he I he seems to be Oh, he looks like he's not here at the moment. Oh, okay. Okay, Abid, go ahead with the, go ahead with the questions. Oh, he has a couple of questions. He, he commented this time. Okay, well, I can see him there. Hello, Professor Alatas. Hello. Hello. Great to see you after a long time. Thank you very much. Very very kind of you. Thank you. So please um, go ahead with your questions. Uh, yes, yes. Doctor uh, uh, Doctor Leili Udin. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just have, um, uh, I guess, two or three uh, questions. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my first question is, um, what do you mean when you say vernacular socialism? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the term has been used, of course, in, in many contexts, vernacular so socialism or vernacular Marxism. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if you could clarify what you, you mean by that, mm -hmm. um, would you also be able to, I mean, would would one um, refer to uh, socialism in um, in Europe, socialism in Russia, uh, in China, also uh, as uh, right. vernacular so socialism? That that's one. Uh, the the other question um, has to do with um, um, the place of historical materialism and dialectical materialism. 
mm. now what i understand what i understand from many proponents of uh, uh, islamic socialism they distance themselves from historical materialism because of their um a uh, view which 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 i think may be uh, mistaken that historical materialism is not uh, compatible with uh, with islam mm -hmm. so we're talking about muslims who are believing muslims and who are trying to integrate socialism into islam generally there seems to be a rejection of uh, of historical materialism now are you mm -hmm. are you familiar with with um, uh, whether it's bashani or, or or others who um who take a different view with regard to historical uh, materialism mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Great. Um, I thank you, Professor Thus. I wasn't actually expecting you, but this is a this is a real honor um, for me. Um, in terms of vernacular socialism, and what I'm trying to refer to is the particular place that Bashani is drawing his ideas from, and where we can sort of the particular location in which he was acting and the particular location in, in the particular spaces in which he was drawing his ideas from. Now, what we find with Bashani is that what he's doing is that he's, um, we can't, I mean, what Bashani is doing is not, he's thinking about socialism without actually um, sort of linking it to particular models or intellectual trajectories that are sort of taken to be sort of um, that one would assume as conventional when thinking about socialism. So he's sort of trying to, he's deriving it from his relationship with his peers, whether it's Maulana Azad Subhani or it's his sort of actions in Assam or his um, sort of his time in Pakistan. And what I think it, about what he's doing is that he's not really thinking about, I mean, he is thinking about capitalism, but he's also thinking about it with socialism without sort of that particular relation to capitalism. Now there's a sort of, you know, it's how, I guess, Nyere thinks about Ujama itself, African socialism, right? When sort of Ulysses Nyere is talking about Ujama and African socialism, He's thinking about it in a way where he's saying he's de he's sort of thinking about it without um, sort of linking it to capitalism. He actually says, this is something that we've had. This is something, Ujama, or this idea of familyhood is something that we've had. And Bashani is also doing something quite similar. He's drawing his idea, his idioms and his practices and ideas of socialism from his particular location, from the particular genealogies of that space. Um, so, uh, so that's, I mean, it's not the best idea of what sort of vernacular socialism is, but it's sort of, it's not my, the sort of the best definition of vernacular socialism. But what I'm trying to say is that we don't necessarily need to trace Bashani's relationship to socialism through whether he has read Marx or whether he's sat with or sort of his relationship to particular texts and doctrines. We can think about it in relationship to in what he's trying to do or his relationship with peasants and workers and where he primarily sp spends his time um so that's this sort of the where i'm sort of trying to sort of pick up on uh, vernacular socialism um with the question of historical materialism and uh sort of dialectical materialism I think that's an interesting question. I don't really have an answer to that, actually, at this moment. I, mean, I think Bashani is what he's trying to do from sort of his work with on sort of historical sort of so what he's trying to do is actually sort of locate his politics within a particular material condition, right? He's trying to say that this is the politics of justice and social, whether it's justice, equality, and dignity has to be or whether where we understand islam from has to be from that particular material sort of location that we can only sort of formulate our understanding of islam through um through, through sort of the particular social economic conditions of um of these peasants and workers um i don't actually really have an answer there so i'm not going to sort of venture too far into that to that question but i mean i would 
actually probably throw that back to you and would like to hear your thoughts since we have the opportunity actually your thoughts on what vernacular socialism might be for you or how you understand it if it's possible for the for the speakers to throw questions back at the Sorry, do, is it all right if I if I respond? Oh, to that? yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. Please go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Musarab, I I couldn't hear you, so I didn't know that you were speaking. Actually, yeah, yeah, no, no, mine was muted. Uh, I see. Yeah. Anyway, I won't I won't take uh, won't take time because it's not it's not uh, the floor is not for me. Uh, I suppose what occurs in my mind when you speak about vernacular socialism. Um, when I think about vernacular language, which was a very common term used uh, by the British uh, during the colonial period, um, I suppose they meant it by, by vernacular language, they meant um, local languages um, mm -hmm. and not the universal English language, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that, I don't think that is the, the connotation that uh, um, that you have when you um, are speaking about vernacular socialism. Yeah. But vernacular can also refer to the everyday language of um, mm -hmm. the common people, as it were. Um, yeah. So um, perhaps that is what you mean by vernacular socialism. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if, if there is such a thing as vernacular socialism in that sense, then there should also be the opposite, meaning, um, you know, a high philosophical uh, mm -hmm. oriented uh, tr tradition of, of socialism sure. and, and I suppose yeah. definitely in the South Asian context you have both but mm -hmm. what is interesting is what, what is important is to uh, you know to show what the differences differences are between the more theoretical mm -hmm. um, sophisticated uh, for lack of a better term um, articulation of socialism um, perhaps mm -hmm. more academic as opposed to the vernacular socialism, so those differences, I think, have to be uh, to be drawn out. Abid, next question. Sorry, before uh, we could take the next question, I, you know, this is not exactly relevant, but I was thinking of the historical materialism thing in this context, and I was just wondering that you know, when in Marxism there is always this idea of this immanent material world. And how could Islam reconcile itself with that kind of an idea where there is already a God, right? Somewhere It's not just an immanent mm -hmm. world. I'm, because I've, I've been recently reading uh, for my own research some of the French philosophers like Bataille, uh, Nossi, Jean-Luc mm -hmm. Nossi, Nossi and others. And I was thinking of the idea of ecstasy, you know, in that context, that community could be founded on a notion of ecstasy, not mm -hmm. necessarily on an immanent idea of a community that reproduces itself constantly, you know, the mm -hmm. work is whose essence is is work basically, not mm -hmm. that kind of a community. So, I would say here Islam could probably, like a specter, it could be the source of that ecstasy that sort of mm -hmm. opens this out and not just mm -hmm. keeps it immanent within the material mm -hmm. world itself. Mm -hmm. So that's my short intervention. I don't know how relevant that is for this, but I was just wondering because of you know uh, looking at at it philosophically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we could go and take the next question. Hello. Uh, the first uh, question is from Reza Mahmoud. He uh, says, how do you address the controversies regarding Bhashani? For example, the rejection of six points, accusations of collaboration. How do you think it's possible to be a non-collaborationist revolutionary? while being pro-China, since PRC saw the Bang Bangali liberation movement as separatist and Soviet social imperialism. So how do I respond to the comments of him being a collaborator or... Uh, I mean, there are, yeah. Well, yeah, like... Uh, is it's it possible to rephrase the question? Can you rephrase it? I mean, you don't have to read out necessarily. Where is the question? Just rephrase it, please. Yeah, like uh, uh, he wants you to address the controversies regarding Bhashani, which mainly the rejection of six points and accusations of being a, a collaborator with uh, Pakistan and a pro-China face. I mean, there are 
several controversies around Bashani simply because he was all sort of imagining, a, in, in some ways, an alternative trajectory um, from sort of Mujib. But he doesn't actually, I mean, I would say that actually what he's not doing is rejecting six points, he's expanding on the six points. And he's trying to think about what, you know, if we were to, so there's this idea that Bashani rejects six points, and I'm, I'm not entirely sort of, and, and my work does not suggest that. In fact, what I find is that Bashani is doing otherwise. He's trying to expand on what a world would look like where there is greater provincial autonomy for, for, sort of, uh, for the Bengali populace or for Pakistan at large. What, what, what sort of world do we want to create with this? And, and this is where he, sort of his world encompasses a sort of a much more sort of anti, sort of a, a sort of a socialist outlook than that of Mujib. In fact, the Awami League sort of adopts socialism post-election. In some ways, they adopt it into the sort of, and, and what Bashani is doing is that he's talking about it. He's not, he doesn't reject the six points and he's expanding and he's broadening on the ideas of, uh, of Mujib. And I think it's, um, and I think that the idea that he was, I mean, I, I think there is nothing really that suggests that I've found that it suggests that he was collaborating with the Ayub regime. I think what we what we sort of mark as collaboration is what I say a retreat from public visibility. Now, if you're not seen in urban spaces, if you're not seen as political in the political capital, there's an assumption that somehow you've you know you've become politically unimportant or you have withdrawn from protest, but what Bashani is doing otherwise, what I've shown is that he was actually organizing and mobilizing his constituencies elsewhere. So, I mean, I, there's various controversies and we can, I mean, and I think it, what I would like to do is actually, and I don't want to really talk, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sort of invalidate them, or I don't want to validate them, but what I'm trying to sort of, um, do here is actually suggest that what's happening here is an alternative trajectory that's being um, that's being put out by Bashani that doesn't necessarily contradict or doesn't go against what the majority of you know doesn't really contradict what the Bengali populace wanted. Okay, and next question is from uh, Sarah Shahid. Mm -hmm. uh, can you expand on how Bhashani envisions solidarity and coalition between atheist socialists and Islamic socialists? How does uh, Bhashani revolutionary solidarity overcome communalism? Um, I mean, or did it? Or did it? Or did it? Or did I, mean. it? <laughs> I mean, I think did it or is a, is a tougher question, but I think, I mean, there's a you know, I think it's what I said with the buyer itself, or it's what I said with his languages, right? In the, in the sort of the language that he addresses, what what we're finding it with the the buyer, which has been these traditionally religious instruments that provide a sort of an individual relate, sort of an individual relationship between the uh, sort of the the peer and Muri. Bashani is widening that relationship up. He's suggesting that the, sort of this world does not simply belong to to those who are religious. It also belongs to those who have who are secular itself. I mean, when he's talking about the shorba hara, right? He's he's sort of talking about he, he he's sort of bringing in these histories where he's connecting Mao to Abu Zar al Gifari, right? The the person he's connecting, he's making these histories, and he's sort of forging solidarities that. In some ways, that transgress those boundaries of the the sacred and the profane, and he's saying that in some that 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 these can be can be brought together. Um, I mean, in terms of like whether he's in terms of who was sort of signing up to the bio, who was there in sort of the the meetings of NAP, or I mean, these were peasants who came from all of North Bengals. These were sharecroppers, these were fisher folk um, people, these were uh, child dwellers who came from all communities. I don't think that there's something that's particularly 
sort of uh, where, where Bashani was addressing, or it's, I mean, whilst the language is religious, in, in some ways is not one that's simply sort of focused on the betterment or on the social improvement of Muslims alone. What Bashani is trying to do, say, is bring in with the sort of, uh, sort of forge um, these sort of wider solidarities through a religious language, but not necessarily one that's for the benefit of one community alone. Uh, Abed, oh, if, I, if I see yeah. right, there's a question. Reza Mahmood would like to ask a question and would like to ask it directly. So should yeah. I think? Uh, yeah, should, please, I think, I think, please. Uh, Please go ahead. Okay, Mr. Mahmoud, uh, could you please ask your question directly? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you for elaborating on the point where you mentioned that the six points demand, he really expanded it instead of like rejecting it completely. Uh, then what I really mean by collaborationism here is that uh, you know how at the time of Bengali liberation movement, there was this idea of Peking Ponti and Moscow Ponti. That's mm -hmm. why I'm saying that how is it possible to be a Peking Ponti and at the same time to be non-collaborationist? Because you see how um, China, People's Republic of China at that time saw the Bengali liberation movement as being uh, Soviet social imperialism project, quote unquote. So that's why I raised the question. Sure. How is it yeah. possible to be a picking bounty and also non collaborationist? Sure. Okay. So, I mean, th there's various splits happening in NAP at that point. And one of the, I mean, so, I mean, there's a, you know, and that's sort of in the 70s itself. And what we find is during the Liberation War that Bashani is actually writing letters to China asking or appealing for help, right? And appealing for help for this liberation war itself. So there is a sort of a sort of a split that's happening even during that point where Bashani is, is suggesting, you know, that's happening between those who are of the pro-Peking faction. So Bashani, once he receives no response, he actually breaks with China and says, well, we will go our own way. So there, I mean, the, so that collaboration that you're talking about is not necessarily there. Bashani is actually appealing in some ways. He's the one appealing for an independent East Pakistan from sort of 1970s, early 70s, where he sees there's no hope of sort of achieving that sort of provincial or, um, or more sort of provincial autonomy in that regard. So. I mean, my answer is that there is a split within the pro-Peking faction as well. And there's a split that, I mean, and there's a rejection of where China stands um, on the sort of, on the 1971, and there's a rejection by Pashani on where China stands. Um, so, yeah, that's my, I, I okay. guess. Okay, I see, I get your answer. And another question I had is that I was, especially interested in this lecture because of the fact that um, it's essential to learn about Bhashani mm. because by that method we are going to understand the context, overall context of Bengali uh, people. That mm. is, it's not that much uniform that you can force socialism and other ideas on them. You need to connect that idea with the religion in order to reach to their sentiments, right? So for that reason, I am interested in this lecture. And in that relevance, I had a question that, mm -hmm. do you think Pashani has a role in the non-sectarianist activism in Bengal somehow? Do I think that Pashani has a role in the non-sectarian sort of politics or? Yeah, okay. something like that, because uh, mm -hmm. You see, one of the largest problems in Bengal is sectarianism, and you need to solve that somehow. And it is up to the religious people to uphold non-sectarianism and, like, you know, mm -hmm. what you mm -hmm. say, 
And yeah. for that reason, do you think Pashani has a role in that, in like moderating the Muslims so that they are more tolerating those who are not tolerating? I mean, uh, yeah, yes. I mean, I think Bashani is uh, sort of was propagating a very non-sectarian and sort of you know um, idea of Islam. If you think about um, sort of who the NAP itself is a very motley coalition of people who come from various religious backgrounds, who of various religious temperaments, um, some non-religious, and I mean there and so. I mean, his his politics also. If you're thinking about where he's talking about Islamic socialism, he's drawing upon people, say Abu Zar al Ghifari, who he talks about as the early Bashani is talking about him as the early sort of uh, Muslim, one of the early Muslim socialists. Right now, Abu Zar al Ghifari is more renowned, sort of more known in Shia historiography than um, than sort of Sunni historiography, and that's for his sort of resistance or to the political to to Khalif Uthman, right? And so it's, I, I think there's, a, I mean, I, I think there's a particular, I mean, I would say that there is, yes, I mean, I would agree with you. I, I mean, I think Bashani does play an anti sectarian sort of part in the politics of India. Yeah, exactly. And uh, why uh, I think. Can we, that can, we, can, we, can we go to others now? Because uh, there could be other questions. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Uh, yeah. We are sorry, but Thank we you. have some other questions. Radhika Saraf, uh, Miss Radhika. Uh, could you please elaborate on Islamic socialism for Vashani as dealing from capitalism and always existing? Because how do we then explain the historical specificity of the idea and Vashani's need for this idea as opposed to other? Available rhetoric. Uh, the specificity of uh, particularity of Islamic socialism in the case of Hassani. That, that's okay. a question. Okay, so I mean, Hassani is also sort of, you know, he is living, he is a man who's uh, sort of living through a period where there's a whole transition happening from colonial sort of um, colonialism to independence. He is sort of he's emerging from you know this is a, a, the sort of he he's he's sort of going through a period of uh, sort of there's the wars and the famines and so this is idea of what does it mean right so Bashani is thinking very clear like sort of I think thinking importantly or thinking placing importance on the question of what does it mean to be free what does it mean to be sort of to, to to decolonize ourselves, what it does, what does it mean to be human? And I think partly he looks around him, and he looks at the burden or the expectations that are placed on his um, sort of on the peasants and the workers, and he's trying to draw on ideas around him. So this is also a period of socialist interna internationalism, right? We have, you know, the forties to the sixties is also about. Um, not 40s, but from the 90s and 20s to the 60s, it's a period of international socialist internationalism. So there's various ideas of what it, you know, what does, you know, there's various ideas that are going there that, you know, about around sort of human dignity or social dignity, social justice. And Bashani's thinking through these ideas and he's also linking, linking it to his own understandings and interpretations of what you know, well, how, how does Islam afford social dignity and how does Islam afford justice? And he realizes that there's a very specific material question to be asked there. Who is who is being privileged as we sort of emerge into the sort of period of independence? How is it that, you know, 
that independence has worked for certain sections of people and it hasn't worked for the other sections of people which um you know and you know, how has it been that there hasn't been any of that sort of material emancipation and and he's and he's thinking about the material conditions and he's thinking and he's looking around looking around him and he's having those questions and 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 i think he's being influenced by I mean, he's being influenced by the sort of the, the various sort of the politics around him, the various intellectual sort of um, histories that are floating around this period. But there's also his own understanding of the material conditions um, there. I mean, Bengal, East Bengal uh, period, and not just East Bengal and sort of Pakistan, go through this whole 1940s to 70s is actually a period of crisis. Bengal. There's various food crises that are happening at all points. It's it's, it's a sort of the, the verge of it's always on the verge of a famine or a sort of a, sort of, a, of some ep epidemic. And it's just like, what is happening here that is not working? Why why do these people? Why do the people in Pakistan not seem or feel free? So he's looking at material conditions and he's trying to sort of bridge it together with the sort of various ideas that are floating around at that point. And, and some of the, these ideas are coming out from his trips to sort of whether it's Syria, to Egypt, to um, he goes to Cuba as well. So, I mean, the militant, I think some of the, the question that Musharraf was asking, where is the intellectual tra tra trajectory? Is it coming just from his time in, in China? No, it's coming from earlier trips to Egypt, to Syria, to the World Peace Council in Stockholm. He's meeting various, but he, it's coming from his trips to London to meet a sort of a diasporic community and thinking about the challenges that they're facing there. But it's also coming, and it's also coming from his time in Cuba. Um, so there's various trajectories that he's drawing upon. And, and, and yeah, so that's, I'm not sure if I've answered the question, but by and short, yeah, that's, yeah, that's one of the answers I have. Uh looks like there's one more question so i was actually about to ask my question mm -hmm. but you have sort of answered already my question about you know was it just china or uh, you know some other influences as well like the transnational linkages in his thinking mm -hmm. so you have already addressed that sumit uh, has an has a question yeah yeah I have, can i ask you a question yeah yes please <laughs> yeah so Lily, thanks for this uh, brilliant talk um you know, you mentioned about, uh, you know, this uh, Bashani's uh, relation with the uh, urban communists uh, mm -hmm. who were uh, obviously reading Marx. Uh, and, you know, at that point, probably Bashani is not necessarily getting familiarized himself with Marx. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, my question is that, um, you know, within the urban communists, particularly if you want to say, uh, there is this constant tension that uh, particularly in India, uh, there is this uh, thing about caste or gender or religion. Mm -hmm. and these are all identities that are, uh, you know, in some way creating a diversion for the class unity. Yeah. Okay. So that's obviously the, if you want to call it for, for this moment, uh, the urban communists. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but was there that kind of tension uh, through which, um, you know, the urban communists were trying to imagine uh, this, um, you know, the working class, uh, you know, uh, so that that can be, uh, organized to fight against the capitalist or landlord. Uh, whereas on the other hand, uh, is Bhashani actually taking into consideration these kind of problems within the working class? Mm -hmm. the, oh. the problems that could be emerging from the gender relations, the problem that could be emerging from the caste relations within the workers, uh, whether in the rural or the urban settings. Uh, so is there a kind of tension that you see uh, that was there between these two kind of strands uh, who are probably imagining socialism, as you are suggesting. Maybe one can call that vernacular socialism. And there is a socialism of the urban Marxists. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is there something that you can tell us about that? Yeah. I mean, I think there is a tension between Bishani and the urban Marxists, right? They abandon him at, in the end because he's in some way, I mean, they abandon him perhaps because he is too invested in the politics of what's happening in those particular communities. I think what they say, I mean, a lot of the, and he's not involved in, I think what Bashani is doing is that he's sort of involved in these. So the tension with the urban communists is that they, that they need him, but they don't want him, 
right? They, they, they say that they, I mean, Muzaffar Ahmed and all of those, are, are sort of, you know, these people were like, we don't understand what it is that Bashani has or what he does, but we need him. We need his language. We need his, uh, we, we need his relations. We need his connection to those spaces. So they are unable to, in some ways, connect to those spaces, whether it's by virtue of caste or whether it's by virtue of their sort of, their, there is something that, that's provided, that's creating this sort of divide and where they need Bashani to mediate those spaces, whether it's the rural, the urban spaces or the various communities that Bashani speaks to. Now, Bashani is very much invested in the very look in the locations that he works in there's a very there's there's a specific reason why bashani doesn't sort of sit in the urban capital or he you know he's his home is in tangai in the outskirts of dhaka he his he's sort of and he finds and he's sitting um and i think it's because he realizes that there's a certain politics that goes missing or that, that you know there's a that that from sitting where he does that he's able to create a very productive tension between um the urban and the rural space which the urban people which the urban marxists aren't able to they're somehow able unable to create a productive relationship with those spaces so it's, there's something about how bashani is con communicating to um to people um sort of communicating with people in rural spaces that they don't get now in terms of the communities that bashani works with now so you see some of it, a lot of it is that he's so Bashani is the the sort of the union leader of fisher folk um sort of at one point he's the union leader of the fisher folk um union he's also the union leader of the railway workers and in some ways he it, like any other union leader he's an outsider right he's not a he's not a fisherman he's not a he's not a railway person but i think there's a particular reason why bashani is there in those spaces it's not an urban or a bourgeoisie leader in those communities and i think it's because bashani is able to relate in a way um is able to connect to those lives or speak in a particular way or speak to a particular um speak sort of speak to them in a particular way that the urban bourgeois the bourgeoisie don't have and um, the urban intellectuals aren't able to do so um so there's something that interesting that happens and i i wanted to sort of um sort of raise it here as a so one of the things that leads to bashani um being dropped by the urban intellectuals is because he's unable to make a decision on who the next leader should be right he's he's unable to make a decision or they say that he's unable to make a decision on the leader so on who the next leader should be for nap right bashani in the 60s is in his 70s and so and i think it's because the urban leaders have this very formal you know way of organizing it's a very structured way it's a hierarchical way of organizing and bashani said i'm not interested in making the decision as to who the leader is i have no that that is not where my interest lies you choose between yourself who your leaders are and so they the left end up calling him indecisive right you're indecisive on these matters but what Bashani is trying to say, we don't need to live with these hierarchies. We don't need to live with these structures or what these questions or that the decision of, as to who a leader should be should not necessarily emanate from me. It should not come, be coming from me. You should be, th these should be the leader as to the, the next leader who, you know, Nat should be coming from the people itself, right? So and I think it's, it's in some way an ability sort of to sort of, of the urban leaders think about the heterogeneities of these communities to me i'm not sure if i've answered your question but... no, 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 i got the point thanks thanks a lot yeah so before we go to the next question i wanted to actually add on to what sumit said because that's something that interests me as well when i read some of the bangladeshi novels uh it interests me because i wanted to know a little more about Bhasani's own intellectual trajectory like how well read mm -hmm. was he uh, in Marxist literature, was he very well read? Did he derive his ideas from reading, you know, all the volumes of Capital? What exactly went into the making of this man, or was he like one of those vernacular, you know, sort of we can't even call them Marxists? Vernacular, you can say leaders who are, you know, who are sort of 
formed by the experiences of oppression that they see around themselves like i'm asking this question because in west bengal that's exactly what happened you know if you go to the rural areas you have these leaders who are not at all well versed in marxism i mean even when the marxists were in power so they are intellectual they were more like you know vulgar marxism they just heard from someone some leaders in calcutta they just imbibed those ideas they came to the villages and then they started you know the only thing they could probably say that the, the sarbaharas should now be in power or we should you know uh, we should topple these people the bourgeois the businessman the industrialist mm-hmm. whatever it is so i my question would be that what was his intellectual trajectory i mean is is it possible to shed light on that a little bit because we know he went to deoband and i'm sure in deoband they were not teaching him this no but they were teaching him other things right they were i mean this is also a very fertile time in the deoband as well so he was right. being taught by leaders who were involved in the reshmi rumal conspiracies and the anti imperialist conspiracy sort of in one of the most significant anti sort of imperialist Sort of conspiracies of its time, or sort of um, a struggle of its time. I mean, he's also so that. Look, I don't know if he's read Capital. I it, it's it, it is not clear to me as to whether he's read Capital. I don't know whether, but I think he he has been around people who have read Capital, and I think those people around him have talked about it. I mean, the and 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 I think he's absorbed. that sort of the particular he's absorbed it in ways and, I, and I'm not in a very crude or um I'm not in a crude or vulgar way i think he's listened to it but if you want to talk about the sort of the specificities of marxism i think um that i mean i don't see bashani doing that right i don't i don't think his intellectual trajectory right lies in how much he read of marx or how much he read of other sort of um sort of other socialists or, or or thinkers other socialist thinkers but i think he is in conversation with them whether he's in conversation with them in the world peace council where he's going and meeting these uh, sort of whether he's in conversation he's meeting robert franklin williams he's meeting like in china he's meet like in in 1950s he's meeting um pablo neruda he's meeting nazim hikmat he is meeting um sort of a he's going to china and he's meeting amar uzegan and he's meeting um uh, who's an algerian socialist who's writing one of the texts one of the critical texts of islamic socialism of his time is meeting robert franklin williams and i think he's borrowing from that so i mean i don't want to dismiss the intellect what i'm trying to do with this whole talk is not dismiss the intellectual trajectory of a person who does not read and so who somehow we end up equating as having this very basic or crude understanding of sort of marxism i mean what is it what is it that marxism is other than an understanding of a specific hit, historical condition right it's a, he's and pishani is doing that he's sitting in his space and he's looking at what's around him and he's looking at the ideas floating around him and he's building on those and I'm, so i mean i don't want to seem too defensive about the fact that you know pishani isn't being hasn't been um sort of reading capsule others but i think right i can move on that question whether he's read it or not no, but no, i think that's that's, that's perfectly fine yeah but he's he is sort of i i also wanted to say that he is in conversation with people like azad subhani is also in conversation with people like abul hashim right azad subhani is sort of leading trade union workers in kanpur at that time and he's also writing texts around islamic socialism abul hashim is clearly writing texts around um islamic socialism and i think they're definitely having these conversations about what it mean what sort of yeah how does how do we bring these two different worlds together thank you very much uh, so we we'll, i think you must be tired by now so we'll just take one more question i think we need to end here because i can understand you're speaking from 7 o'clock almost it's going to be 9 you must be tired by now uh, so abed yours is going to be the last question okay yeah yeah my question is how would you analyze the secularization of assalamu alaikum and utilization of an islamic greeting as means to address bengali liberation how do i understand it how do you like how do you um, see when how do you analyze the application of a islamic greeting in a mm-hmm. liberationist language or socialist language i think that's a 
That's a great question. I, I and I haven't really. I mean, I mean, I know that there's a particular sort of um, sort of emphasis that is given to the salam that Bashani makes in the 1957 Kagmari, which is seen as a way of um, sort of uh, of saying goodbye to Pakistan if they don't sort of uh, think about if they're not thinking about sort of non-aligned foreign policy and if they're if they're not thinking about um, and in terms of uh, and thinking about provincial autonomy for East Bengal. I mean, I think it speaks to, in the same way that I've spoken about, you know, the Islamic socialism, Bashani is um, using sort of language that is familiar, you know, that, that that's powerful. It sort of evokes a particular sort of emotion. When someone says salam to you or when someone, it evokes a particular emotion. But usually what he's saying, I mean, the, the salam evokes the, sort of an emotion or, or sort of an idea of peace. But here Bashani is saying it's actually not peace that I'm declaring. I'm declaring war with you with the salam, right? It's not declaring war, but declaring resistance. That the salam, that the language that we, the religious language that we use can be used for in many ways, in multiple ways. And I think that's what he's trying to do with the, the salam, that he's trying to say that this in many ways can be a very benign thing that we say. This could be a you know your everyday greeting. But this could also be the religious language can also be a very political and a very powerful language. This sort of this, you know, the salam is something that's familiar to the spaces or the communities that he comes from. And he's saying, look, you don't need to you don't need to talk in a very sort of sophisticated theoretical the salam in itself tells says so many things right it says it, it has it has many it has multiple meanings and in the way in the spaces that you use it so when he used the salam in kagmari um he wasn't sort of you know he wasn't greeting the pakistani rulers he wasn't greeting sohrawadi who's come to um kagmari to talk about you know the reason why we should have a more bipartisan foreign policy or uh, military pacts with the US, with Seattle and center, he's actually saying the Salaam, he's using the Salaam as a, as, a, as a tool for resisting those things. And I think he's saying, he, and he's making it visible to his communities, right? He's saying it to the communities that he's located in, that the language you use is a very political one, um, or it can be a very political one. So I think um, that's, I mean, essentially, that's what Bashani is using language that's familiar to make it into a very, you know, a political tool. He doesn't, in some ways, what he's trying is that you don't need to have these sort of a way of talking or a way of articulating that in which is inaccessible, right? You don't need to have this lengthy discourse as to why you know one should have foreign policy or why why one should be in military pact or not. The salam in itself says a lot. So, yeah, I think is that. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and I should thank you once more on behalf of Bees for an excellent lecture. Uh, you know, it's a privilege to listen to you. Before I hand over now to Motin, I have, I want to make a request on behalf of Bees to Professor Said Farid Alatas. Uh, that it will be, you know, a great privilege for us if you could deliver a lecture uh, on the platform or base. I mean, all of us would be very eager to, you know, hear you to listen to you here. So, Professor Alatas, are you around? I mean, I can see you, but yes, yes, I'm, I'm here. So, uh... could we please request you on behalf of base uh, to speak yeah. to us? I mean, we'll of course write to you formally about it, sure. but. Sure. Thank you very much. It's it's uh, would be an honor for me. Uh, I'd, I'd be very interested to to do it. There there are so many um, in in the early days uh, during during my father's time. My father mm -hmm. wrote on Islam and socialism, and uh, he was influenced by the Indonesian uh, Islamic socialists, who are in turn influenced by the Indians from the from the turn of the century, the last century. So I think it's very interesting to make those connections and. Mm -hmm to raise other issues as well. I'd be happy to do it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much for accepting. And uh, Thank you. 
Motein would be in touch, of course. He's the man who is organizing this lecture. So he's the guy. He's the man of the hour. So he'll be in touch with you regarding this, for sure. And someone was asking, actually, someone is asking Professor Alatus to read Ali Shariati. And I was just wondering that you, are, you have written on Ali Shariati. I have heard you speak on Ali Shariati. So uh, someone is asking you, in fact, that you should read Ali Shariati. So anyway, so that was, that was a little funny. Yeah, maybe that person didn't know. <laughs> So I now, OK, thank you once more, uh, Dr. Laileuddin. Thanks. It's a privilege. And I hand it over now to Mr. Motin. Yeah, thank you, Mosavda. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Dr. Nargis, madam. She is a professor at Alia University to propose formal word of thanks. And also thanks to Professor Alatas. And it was wonderful listening to you when Professor Vinod Jairad invited you in the University of Hyderabad. And, and Mosavda was also there at that time. Thank you. Madam, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Martin, sir. Assalamu alaikum and good evening to all of you present here. Uh, we have come to the end of today's lecture. So thank you, Base, for giving me the opportunity to deliver a vote of thanks today. On behalf of Bengali Academia for Social Empowerment, at first, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude and thanks to our uh, esteemed speaker, today's esteemed speaker, Dr. Laili Uddin from King's uh, College London to deliver a beautiful and informative speech on the topic, Maulana Bhasani, Red Maulana and Subalterns um, Muslims of South Asia. Thank you, Dr. Laluddin. It was great hearing from you. Thank you so much. Next, uh, I my heartfelt thanks goes to Mosharraf Hussain Khan, Assistant Professor from Jindal Global Un uh, University, Haryana. Sir, um, we are really happy to get you here uh, with us again and sharing this session. And I feel that whenever we in, we are in need, you are there with us. So thank you so much, sir, once again. Do you think I'm some outsider? I'm very much part of your group. Don't forget that. <laughs> Thank you so much. So next, uh, I must thank Professor Syed Farid al uh, Professor Amjad Hussain, Dr. Sumit Maskar, uh, for join and all intellectuals who joined today's program. And your presence is really a matter of encouragement and motivation for us. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I must thank base uh, president, vice president, GS, and all members, especially the team who are really working uh, hard arranging this lecture series happening successfully. Thank you all. Last but not the least, I convey my thanks and appreciation to all our beautiful audience and delegates throughout and beyond the country who joined the program and shown their constant interest on base lecture series happening. So thank you all once again. Let me announce our next base lecture series number 38. It will be on 25th August, 7 p.m. onwards. Topic is nursing, past, present, and future perspective. Speaker is Professor Sriti Mani, Principal Government College of Nursing, Medical College and Hospital, Kolkata. So thank you all once again. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Laili and Musarabda. Oh, it was yeah, wonderful. Thank <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, everyone.